Our first speaker is Eric Tans. He's environmental sciences, he's the sciences coordinator and the environmental sciences librarian at Michigan State University Libraries. His research areas include sustainable practices in libraries and the history of the Red Cedar River. All right, thanks, Kathleen. <laughs> um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my presentation, I think, will be a bit of a change of pace from some of the other presentations we've had so far today. But I'm really pleased to be able to share uh, about the development of uh, my story map close beside the winding cedar, uh, the Red Cedar River at Michigan State University. Um, and you can access the story map with the link that I think just got posted to the chat. So I encourage you to explore it uh, throughout the presentation. Um, and close beside the Winding Cedar is also included in the conference map gallery. So you can check it out there as well. Um, and next slide, please. So before I get started, I just want to give a brief land acknowledgement. I think this is especially important given the nature of the project. Um, and I was intentional about including in my story map uh, some sections on the uses of the river from before the founding of what would become MSU, uh, which I hope is sensitive to the experiences of the original residents of the land. Um, so Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. The university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. Um, next slide, please. So I'll be talking briefly about uh, my research into the history of the Red Cedar and its relationship to MSU, uh, the process of creating the story map through my participation in a digital scholarship uh, lab project incubator program here at MSU. And then I'll demonstrate some story map content and share some of my reflections on community reactions to it. Next slide, please. So the Red Cedar River has a complex and paradoxical relationship with Michigan State University. And if you're not familiar with our campus, the river just flows right through the middle of it. Um, it's one of the most iconic and beloved features of our campus, yet in many ways it's also uh, overlooked. Uh, this was first brought to my attention through my work as a librarian. I, I had received a question from a student group that was conducting research, a research project on the history of the dam that we have on the river on our campus. I assumed this would be an easy, uh, uh, easy reference question and immediately started looking up in our catalog to find the history book about the history of the Red Cedar River. And I was surprised to find that there, there was no book that was written about the history of the river. Um, and a further investigation into the question, uh, I found that none of the official publications in the history, in the university's history, uh, provided a comprehensive assessment of the river. And it was often completely unmentioned in early accounts of the school. So I decided to set out to, to help fill in some of these gaps in the history of our campus and, and start telling a more complete version of the story of MSU and the river. Next slide, please. So in order to fill in this gap, uh, I conducted a, a research sabbatical in the summer and fall of 2022. Over the course of six months, I reviewed materials from books, articles, theses and dissertations, newspaper archives from various collections within the MSU libraries, including our special collections, uh, plus uh, the MSU archives, the Capital Area District Library Local History Collection, and uh, the local Nokomis Center, uh, which is uh, a Anishinaabe uh, uh, cultural center, um, their research library. Next slide, please. Uh, so my sabbatical ended in December of 2022, but I continued my project uh, by participating in uh, what we, we our project incubator, which is a collaboration between the MSU Libraries Digital Scholarship Lab and the Digital Humanities at MSU uh, program, uh, which is based out of the College of Arts and Letters. The Project Incubator utilizes a cohort experience to assist with the development of scholarship using digital tools or methods, uh, participating in skill building workshops and co-working sessions, uh, providing a space to experiment and explore uh, while uh, developing our projects. So this is how I learned how to create a story map. I had no, I had no experience with story maps prior to this. Um, 
So I not only developed the basic skills necessary to build the, my story map, but I also worked to understand the flow of information within the tool to more effectively tell the story uh, unearthed by my research. Next slide, please. Uh, so close beside the winding cedar features a mix of text, archival images and audio, newspaper clippings, government documents, university records, maps, and maps to tell a comprehensive story about the Red Cedar River. Next slide, please. And the story map is divided into sections. It looks like I have my notes uh, backwards with the, these two slides, but that's all right. Uh, it's divided into sections uh, for the river's early history, which includes its geological formation, as well as the uses uh, by the Ottawa and Ojibwe peoples, changes to the river's name, uh, its role in the early construction of campus, and its uses in rivalries and recreation for students, as well as industrial uses, pollution and recovery, uh, university athletics and a special safety skills course uh, during World War II, uh, and the river as an inspiration for art and the symbolic nature of the river and its connection to the university. Next slide, please. Uh, and next slide again. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so uh, I'll quickly demonstrate how some of the content types are integrated into the story map. Uh, so I pulled a few screenshots uh, to share. So here at the beginning of the section on the river's name uh, includes both an image from one of the first surveying notebooks uh, to reference the river, along with a newspaper clipping discussing changes to the name over time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, most sections also include a map highlighting relevant locations along the river and across campus, hoping to establish how the various events and locations relate to each other. Uh, spatially. Next slide, please. And many of the featured, uh, many of the images featured in the story map are accompanied by text that provides additional context and helps craft the overall narrative while scrolling through. Next slide, please. And uh, this image uh, was actually not included in my original version of the story map, but it was shared to me by a reader um, whose father attended an event that was described in the text. Um, I thought it was a really great image. Um, the full color uh, was able to demonstrate student efforts to dye the river red. That, that was not uh, originally part of my story map. Um, so I added it um, with permission, of course. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, I think then that well, I'll uh, close with a brief reflection on both the river and the story map. So the, the Red Cedar River uh, holds a special place in the hearts of, of Spartans, uh, particularly alumni who are seeking to maintain a connection to their time on campus. Uh, that's been demonstrated to me time and again as people share their appreciation for uh, close beside the winding cedar uh, and reflect on their own experiences with the Red Cedar River. Uh, it's been really gratifying to hear from people um, who have not only learned new information from my story map, but also felt more connected to their own experiences and memories with the river, um, as demonstrated by uh, the, the folks who shared that the image on the previous slide. So thank you all for your time and attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them at the end. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ana Gabriela Morales Ona, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Agronomy at Purdue University. Her research focuses on precision nitrogen management. Her project aims to provide information for understanding the dynamics of the interaction between nitrogen, corn, soil, and weather across space and time in Indiana fields. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. This is Anna. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Agronomy. And today I will be talking about the integration of satellite and UAV imagery for assessing nitrogen status in corn when plants are small. Next. In corn production, we use a lot of nitrogen fertilizer because it's a very important nutrient for the plant. What is concerning about this is that up to 65% of that nitrogen can be lost, which is not good for the profitability and neither for the environment. Next. A spatial variability of fields is one of the main causes of this uh, nitrogen loss. 
because there are some areas in the field where corn is not going to need that much that much nitrogen. So what is not used is probably going to be lost. Next. When plants are small, is the most effective time for nitrogen application to reduce that nitrogen loss. However, there is a short window of time for doing this because plants grow very fast, especially when it's very hot in the summer. Next. So it is very important to identify practical ways to assess that nitrogen status. UAV imagery can be good, but not always practical. Satellite imagery can be good too, but when plants are that small, the spatial resolution may not be enough. Next. So the objective of this study was to compare metrics from both platforms alone and together for assessing nitrogen status when plants are small. We had two specific objectives. The first one was to compare vegetation indices, BI, from both platforms for estimating nitrogen status. And the second was to determine the integration of BI from satellite and canopy cover from UAV imagery can improve that estimation. Next. To accomplish this, we use two large scale trials located in Indiana. Next. In each of them, we establish sampling points based on NDVI zones. Next. We collect multispectral satellite and UAV imagery when plants were small in both locations. Next. The same day we collect, from each of those sampling points, we collect plant samples to get the actual nitrogen content. Next. We calculate and evaluate five vegetation indices from both platforms, and we calculate canopy cover only from the UAV imagery. Next and we extract the average value of the five indices evaluated and the canopy cover from each of those sampling areas. Next. And for the statistical analysis, we start with the basics. So we define linear regression models based on our objectives. Next. Now, moving to the results. For the first objective, we, were, we wanted to compare vegetation indices from both platforms as a predictor variables of nitrogen concentration and uptake. But before sharing the results with you, I want us to be on the same page. So nitrogen concentration in corn or in any plant is going to be a value that goes from zero up to 100 regardless of the size of the plant, of the location, of the or the field. Or, but nitrogen uptake is the actual weight of nitrogen in a plant. So in that case, the size of the plant or other factors are going to affect that value. So in this, um, I'm going to present the results from the regression models, the R square value. Next. So the darker the green means the greater R square value. And I have two takeaways from this table. The first, if you look at the uh, left side of the table, you're going to see that most of the regression models that focus on nitrogen concentration were not significant, which indicates that whenever we are using vegetation indices, we are looking not uh, at the nitrogen concentration specifically, but we are looking mostly at the nitrogen uptake. The second takeaway from this table is that if you look on the right side on the column for the satellite uh, results, you can see that on the bottom, uh, we have an R square value that is up to 0.48. This is very good for us agronomists that create prescriptions uh, for farmers because this means for us that 
48% of the variability of nitrogen in a field can be explained by, by a vegetation index calculated from satellite imagery. Next. So for the objective two, we use both metrics in the same model to estimate nitrogen uptake. Next. So in this table, I present the results from the canopy cover fraction alone and the vegetation indices alone, and also the both in the same model. The main takeaway from this is that yes, the R square value increase, but the increase was small. Also, you can see the results based on canopy cover were alone were better. But next. If I focus on the operational efficiency and that I have a short window of time, I'm going to go and use the vegetation indices from the satellite imagery. Next. So the take home messages from this is that whenever you're using vegetation indices, you're looking mostly at, at nitrogen uptake than nitrogen concentration. And that the integration of both metrics, yeah, we got better results, but the increase was small. So I would move to use just the satellite imagery. And the next step for me, now that I know that I can use satellite imagery, is to use them to create the prescription that my farmer can apply in the tractor and apply in the field. With that, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Katie Chapman, who graduated from Indiana University Bloomington with a PhD in musicology and a PhD certificate in digital arts and humanities in 2020. She's currently part of the Research Data Services team, a division of University Information Technology Services at Indiana University. She serves as the administrator for IU's ESRI Educational Site License and manages the Indiana Spatial Data Portal. Hi, I'm glad everyone could be here today. So as um, I said, I am the ESRI admin for IU, which means I used to do a lot of working with our GIS community, which is fantastic. And today I just want to give you a quick overview of how we're leveraging these different GIS resources we have access to at IU. Uh, next slide, please. And so, of course, um, a big mission of her my role is supporting our GIS users and supporting GIS and higher ed has become an increasing um, area that both um, university information technology services, libraries, and various other groups on campus are needed to support. We've all seen how GIS has become essential and widespread throughout departments across our universities. Um, pretty much anything can be GIS when you look at it. This became really obvious during the pandemic as we looked at people tracking supply chain, spread, and making dashboards. And as GIS has become more visible, we have more and more faculty trying to incorporate it into their courses, even though they themselves may not have background in it. We have many faculty and students incorporating GIS into their research um, and dissertations, as well as grant funded projects. Classroom instruction is, of course, somewhere we see a lot of outreach for uh, requests for support. Um, and then we have lots of public facing projects that I find really exciting uh, where our university is partnering with other universities or with um, medical communities, hospitals. Um, or with community organizations looking at ecological concerns and issues of social justice. Um, and I will say all of the images in my presentation come from public projects by our users or from the Indiana Spatial Data Portal. So this is all um, IU related um, data. Um, JR support at IU, we have a fantastic team of librarians at IU, um, just generally, but also specifically for the ones who are working with mapping and GIS and they are wonderful support for our GIS users. Um, they offer training support. Um, we have consultations both through libraries and through our Institute for Digital Humanities um, and Humanities, um, IDA. Um, of course, UITS, we have a couple different ways of supporting our GIS users. Me and my team are information technology services. Um, as I said, I'm the ESRI admin. We handle licensing, software access, and coordinate support with ESRI as needed. We're primarily an ESRI campus, so we do um, also have users using open source platforms like QGIS. We also have learning technologies coming from within UITS that actively work to support particularly faculty um, using um, GIS in their classrooms. Um, and of course, vendor support, we get support from ESRI itself. Um, we have a wonderful uh, relationship with 
um, Esri there. It's very generous. Um, next slide, please. Uh, with the resources that they make available to higher ed. Um, we're very grateful for that. And so um, their support comes with that. It just has to all go through um, our office. So since fiscal 23, um, all of the educational software and licenses and analytical tools we have available to us at IU are available to all IU users. Uh, there's no additional cost or chargeback for this. And so anyone at IU, um, core campuses, regional campuses, medical centers, regional centers, anyone with an IU login can access these resources, which is absolutely fantastic. And we've seen more and more people adopting it and we're hoping to see continued growth in the usage of GIS at IU. And um, this includes both um, desktop and cloud resources, primarily a pro, we do still have a few legacy ArcMap users who will be transitioning the next year. Um, the cloud resources have been increased enormously as other ArcGIS users can say. And so we have more and more people looking to leverage those resources and imagery analysis, applying machine learning to their projects um, and using newer licenses like the um, ArcGIS Image or ArcGIS Online um, to do larger scale projects than they could do running on their local machines. And I mentioned support is all coordinated through me as re administrator so we can get technical support um, and then we provide whatever support um, outside of that that we can that our users need. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I just want to give you a quick overview of our GIS community, or specifically our ArcGIS users at IU, since that's what I have the data to track. And so looking at our ArcGIS portal, uh, which includes items from Pro, Online, and all the other cloud platforms, we have a, a little over 72,000 items that our users have created in the past nine years. Um, in the last three months, we've had uh, about 1,000 active users, about half of which are new this semester, which is great. We have a, um, a kind of continually using GIS community um, that's very dedicated to it and consistently adopts GIS in their classes or projects. But then we also get a lot of new users every semester, some of which turn into um, continuous GIS users as well. And since 2014, which is far back as our data went, uh, we've had 7,000 unique IU users using ArcGIS um, software at our university, which is very exciting. Uh, next slide, please. And so, of course, instruction we mentioned is one of the big areas we support um, with GIS and where people are first exposed to it and when they take a class and GIS is involved. And of course, this is for research, um, for technical GIS processing and analysis, for career development, for people who see that GIS as an important part of their career, whether that's in a GIS specific field or in broader training, because as I said, GIS is showing up everywhere now. We do see a lot of people using it for non-mapping applications, which I find very exciting as people who are nervous about making maps but still want to use these resources, particularly story maps, is one of the areas we see a lot of requests for support for. Um, Esri gives us access to a very large group of data sets, census data, demographic data, business analyst um, has its own data sets. And so people want to leverage those data sets. We find people making visualizations, infographics, and dashboards that may or may not have a mapping component, but are still drawing on GIS to help them get their point across. And I mentioned story maps are such a useful tool for contextualizing your data and particularly for communicating it effectively through media, maps or no maps um, to others. And so we see those used a lot in public projects as well as in coursework. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, research, um, we have ever, people using GIS and everything from field research and archeological sites um, to um, you know, field, field work in Indianapolis, uh, looking at pollution situ uh, like this story map represents. We have people relying on ArcGIS for in-depth data analysis, I mentioned visualization and communication. Particularly, we also are seeing an in-growth in community outreach through story maps, but also through a more recently added feature, um, Arc Hub Premium from ArcGIS, which lets people coordinate with community members on projects, um, which has been really great to um, be get to be a part of. Next slide, please. Administration. Um, GIS is just absolutely essential to how the university is run for just about every aspect of um, things these days. Facilities uses it for infrastructure tracking, work orders, monitoring, um, campus resource management. We have this wonderful tree dashboard um, that shows all the trees in the IUB campus, and they can use uh, programs like this to track tree health, height, any other components they need to. And of course, students, whether they realize it or not, are using GIS um, constantly throughout the day, um, everything from bus tracking to wayfinding. And so I mean, Canvas runs on GIS in many ways. Uh, next slide, please. 
We also manage the Indiana Spatial Data Portal, gis to iu.edu. If you're looking for Indiana Spatial Data, this is, is our um, public domain geospatial data from the state on these categories. And our users come from the campus, of course, and our IU community, but everyone from state and local governments, folks from the military, commercial businesses, and everyone else. Uh, last slide, please. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, and it was wonderful to be with you all today. Thank you. Thank you.